worse for your care and for sure worse for the care of your doctor. It is only better for the money, the health care industry. The machine you see was not primarily designed for care, but for billing, to make as much money as possible. We doctors are caught in this mess. We're not only treating the patient, we're treating the screen. And it's not that doctor wants to turn his or her back on you. It's the healthcare industry that has turned its back on both you and your doctor. Call me Shem. Shem, so that's what you refer to. Yeah, sure. Shem Bergman. Welcome to the fourth episode of the MD Edge Post Call Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. I've been doing radio and audio television for about 10 years now, and I've been fortunate enough to interview some prominent athletes and politicians, but I must confess I'm the most excited for the conversation you are about to hear. Today, we welcome the man otherwise known as Samuel Shem. Samuel Shem is, of course, the author of the satirical novel, The House of God. The House of God was published in the 1970s and closely examines the medical residency experience. The House of God is currently selling better than it did when it was originally published. The novel is considered a cult classic and is ranked by Publishers Weekly as the second best satirical novel of all time behind Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. Mr. Shem was kind enough to invite me to his Boston home for a conversation on literature, medical residency, and what he thinks of where the current systems are going. Here now, I bring you to my conversation with Samuel Shem. Call me Shem. Shem. So that's what you refer to. Yeah, Shem Bergman. Sure. Nobody Shem. knows Bergman. Everybody yeah. knows Shem. Everybody knows Shem. So, and I actually now, I can explain yeah, why or where it happened. It's inter yeah. an interesting story. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I, say, I say to everybody, call me Shem. Mm -hmm. Not even Samuel Shem. Just call me Shem. Shem. And how did that happen? Nice, nice name. Yeah. Well, are we recording? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, took the, I took a pen name because I was just starting my psychiatric practice when the House of God was coming out. And people told me psychiatrists shouldn't reveal anything about themselves. And so I said, okay, I'll take a pen name. And, uh, you know, especially because they, uh, you know, I was afraid, oh, this is a sexy, radical book and what, your patients are really going to get troubled by it. So I took this name. And uh, my patients, everybody learned about it. All my patients learned about it. They all came in and they said, oh, my God, you, you wrote that book and it's sexy and it says blah, 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 blah. And that lasted about 30 seconds. And then they said, oh, you should have heard what my son said to me. Oh, my mother is such a pain. They didn't care about me. <laughs> they care about themselves. Yeah. So that was a big lesson. Anyway, so then I had a problem because half the people knew me as Shem and half the people knew me as Bergman. And nobody knew me through writing as Bergman. It was a horrible situation. And finally, it was probably only five years ago. I didn't know what to do about this because I, I couldn't take the name back because that's where all the books are. Mm -hmm. So I happened to be on a tour of, uh, a book tour of uh, Australia and I was speaking at a big convention. And uh, I had finished and I was coming out of the convention auditorium and somebody ran up to me and said, did you hear Bob Dylan? won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And for us of that generation, I mean, he was it. Yeah. He's a genius, absolute genius. And tears came to my eyes, okay? I'm very moved. Next morning, I was on uh, National Australian Radio, and I'm waiting in the anteroom, and I uh, hear he's playing Dylan, <laughs> this guy, this Australian. And then he says how much he liked him. So I walked in and I said, uh, uh, you know, do you do you mind if I if I recite a lyric to my favorite Dylan song? It's an obscure one, mm -hmm. and he said, "Oh no, absolutely not." And uh, mm -hmm. the song is uh, is called "Up to Me." You know? Yeah, I've never heard that one. Oh, yeah, you know, know, if I uh, anyway, the, the, it starts with. Uh, Everything went from bad to worse. Money never changed a thing. Mm. Death kept following me, tracking us down. At least I heard your bluebird sing. And then the verses are, somebody had to tell this tale. I guess it was up to me. Mm. Somebody had to show their hand. I guess it was a beautiful song. Yeah. It was a beautiful song. And uh, so he knew my work somehow, because it's, everybody knows. And he was a big fan. And he said, well, you know, you're sort of the, you're sort of the Dylan of medicine. Mm. So I said, hmm. I took a long walk around Kangaroo Point out into the 
ocean there, and in, it was in uh, Brisbane. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to be Shem. <laughs> He's Dylan. I'm going to be Shem. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, a lot of artists go through that that moment where they think, I, I've committed to the character being me, and I, I'm going to bear the cross, as it were. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It must be a pretty difficult um, difficult thing. The, the The real question is that when you wrote the book, obviously now that it's been reissued it's been out for uh, 50 years 40 40 yeah my bad my math i went to liberal arts school um <laughs> i uh so the book's been out and it's a big deal to to people still it, and you you mentioned it sells more than ever but when you wrote it uh, i'm wondering did you mean to for it to be a, like a bit of a siren or was it therapeutic or, or what did you get out of writing it well uh, I'm, I'm glad you're asking that because only after many years i mean in life you know, you think you know what you're doing. You never know all the cultural historical factors that are pushing you along, mm -hmm. you know, till later and you look back. Um, so later, when I actually, a Boston Globe reporter, many years later, was asking me, you know, why do you write? I never thought of that before. And I just, I forgot what I told her. And then I read the, the article in the paper. That, and what I, I had said is true, just off the top of my head. I said, I write to call attention to injustice mm -hmm. and to point out the uh, danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. Mm, and what's good connection? A good connection is mutual connection where both people benefit. Yeah, the relationship between reader and writer. As exactly, like, like, uh, like Catcher in the Rye said, wish I could call him up. I wrote a piece, you want, the only medical article I ever wrote in my life was called Fiction as Resistance. Mm, uh, yeah, I, I stumbled upon that in my research. Yeah, that's a good one to read because mm. I talk about Tolstoy and yep. his influence and, and, and uh, how the essence, Tolstoy spent 25 years figuring out what is art. Mm. You know, this little thing, what is art? And it comes down to one sentence. It's something like, when the artist experiencing something in the world in a feeling way transmits that through feeling arising in the in the it's not intellectual it's no. you know it's got yeah it's it, it's um it's almost indescribable we used to have these conversations um you know late nights around the campfire as you're growing up in college and as a young person my experiences and you the one of my favorite games is who would you like to spend a night with who would you like to have a beer with and i thought a, a lot of people are, are saying musicians and I, think, I, I would like to know what's going on in their head however experiencing them is listening to their music I don't want to have a conversation with my favorite uh, singer. I want to watch them write a song and work through something. That's and then I want to listen to that because that's how they're meant to communicate um, with the world. I yeah, went to I a concert once, and, and these these two girls they were they were sixteen and they were eighteen. They're a first aid kit when I watched them, and they're amazing. And they're they're just like really fun, and they're clearly high school age girls when they're talking, but when they're singing, they're ancient. Yeah, well, and even Dylan. Beautiful. I don't think you'd like to spend a day with Dylan. No, but I like listening to him. Oh. You're like he's, thinking about he's, it. It's astonishing. Yeah. Astonishing. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, so House of God, what I realized in retrospect really guides me now even more. And that is the feeling I had in the House of God going through that year, the end, by the end of the year, which was much based on reality, mm. what, as my editor used to say, one step off real. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, a good, that's a good line. Uh, which is why it was named, you know, the second best satire of all times by uh, Publishers Weekly. Mm. You know that? No, I did not. I did not yeah. know that. Publishers Weekly made a list of the. Well, who was number one? Who beat you? Don Quixote. Ah, oh, well, that's probably and, that's a pretty good one. And the third? I've heard of that one. Catch Twenty Two. Catch Twenty Two is a good one too. That's yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty it's neat list two. to be sandwiched. You live in long it. enough, you know. People <laughs> pay attention. I feel very good about that because this book had been trashed so much you can't imagine by the other. But anyway. Um, by the end of the, I had been a writer, I'd written plays I had, and, and poetry and short stories, never tried to get anything published. But at that point, all of a sudden, I had this kind of sense that this is so terrible. It was like, a, hey, wait a second moment. Hey, wait a second. Mm -hmm. This is so bad, somebody has to write about it, and I guess it has to be you. Yeah. It's up to me. Yeah. You know, I said. And so I started because I had to do it. Yeah. And I never realized it was about injustice and it was about isolation. The, the big thing that killed people literally in the internship and made them go crazy is isolation. 
Each of us got isolated from each other in this hierarchy. Each of us got isolated from our own authentic experience of the system itself. So you start to think, I'm crazy for thinking that this is crazy. Yeah, everyone else did it. Yeah. What's my problem? Yeah. Right. And the other is we got isolated from our loved ones at home because we were always in the hospital. Sure. So that's what got me going. And I'll just fast forward all these years. Um, I always wanted to write a real sequel to The House of God, mm -hmm. but I had gotten out of medicine. I'd just been a writer, basically. And I speak all over the world and stuff about The House of God and medicine. Uh, in the, uh, emphasizing what I just said is the reason I write of uh, injustice and isolation, et, et cetera. But um, I was out of medicine for many years. And then all of a sudden I got this call from um, NYU Med saying, hey, you want to be a, a uh, professor of medicine in, in NYU Medical School? And I said, oh, yeah, why? And I said, well, you could teach. And I said, well, what do you want me to teach? <laughs> They said, dummy, we want you to teach the house of God. Yeah. And you have to understand, Harvard hated me for the house of God. They did very nasty things to me for the house of God because yeah, it was a, house, a Harvard hospital. Yeah. And here they're bringing me in. So all of a sudden I was back into medicine and I found NYU was a terrific, rather humane school, 47,000 people. The reason it's so good, frankly, the top three guys who run this 47,000 person, the dean and others, top three guys are all refugees from the house of God. Mm. They all trained there. Nah. They were abused like I was. They're the same time as me. And they weren't going to abuse people when they got there. So and to NYU in positions of power. So anyway, all of a sudden I saw modern medicine after many years. And a lot of it is great. But the thing that the hey, wait a second moment, for me, for the new novel, the sequel, which I just finished, um, is the, hey, wait a second, was seeing how much money was at the heart of every decision mm -hmm. and seeing how the screens, the computer screens, were at the heart of every decision and how the screens are, have, have a primary purpose of making the most money. They're billing machines. Right. It really looks, it does the same thing that the House of God does only now. It, it looks at, okay, what's the problem for doctors and patients now? And, yeah. and this is it. Yeah. It's why your doctor, people don't know. Why is my doctor having his back turned to me and typing into a screen? And if we have time, I'll read you a, a little, very short yeah, piece of it. that'd be great. A vice president at the American College of Physicians said that you don't go to medical school to be a, a data entry technician. You go to medical school to treat patients. And what we're finding now is that the amount of time that is spent in front of a screen is egregious. The amount of time not spent seeing or caring for patients is egregious. We had a piece of advice from a psychiatrist that we feature regularly, and she said, if you can you know, find a way to spend 20% of your time with your patients, that's that's not, it should be the other way around. You should try to find 80% of your time to see the patients. That's what you went into medical school for, presumably. So I think for the first time, and hopefully with, with publication of your book, that the, the attention is going to be called on in a very public way. We've got to find a way to figure out this computer thing. And because it, on one hand, it's great that I can exist as a patient and cut through time and space. On the other hand, it can't be um, bogging us down this way. And that's for patients and physicians. It's crazy. Can I read this? You can. Yeah, let's do it. it. it yeah, it's yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, let's do it. Ah, yeah. This is the author's note, beginning of the book. All right. Okay. Your visit to your doctor has become satire. Mm. You walk in, lucky if you get eye contact, and sit across the desk. Your doctor is trapped, hunched behind a computer screen, back or shoulder to you. The doc asks a question, you answer, the keyboard goes click, click, de click, faster and faster. On and on it goes, and you find yourself in the patient's dilemma. Do I keep talking or wait for a break in the action? Usually the next question. Is he or she still listening or not? A new definition of, quote, a good doctor, one who can contort his or her body to touch type while still making eye contact. As you keep waiting, two questions may enter your mind. What is she or he doing? What you don't know is that your doctor is sitting there in front of that screen seething because he is forced to sit in front of a screen seething instead of what he wants to do to talk and listen and be your doctor. 
He spends 60% of every workday at least six hours in front of that screen. Family doctors spend, spend an additional three hours at night at home during pajama time digging out from under the pileup in the screen. This is the doctor's dilemma. Why is he or she doing this? You might think she's doing this because it will be better for your health care. It may not be. It may be worse. Worse for your care and for sure worse for the care of your doctor. It is only better for the money, the health care industry. The machine you see was not primarily designed for care, but for billing, to make as much money as possible. We doctors are caught in this mess. We're not only treating the patient, we're treating the screen. And it's not that your doctor wants to turn his or her back on you. It's the healthcare industry that has turned its back on both you and your doctor. Yeah, it's a point you later bring that back around there at the end. Yeah. Anyway, so it's really what I find really interesting about it is that the existence of EHRs, electronic healthcare records, and, and billing systems is that it has the opportunity to really liberate, but it has not become that. It has metastasized to something completely different. Right. It's in a different area and it's dominating it's dominating healthcare to the point where it has become worse than what it set out to solve. Um, I know that there are some big big names, Bezos and Buffett, that want to re revamp the system, but I think that what we're looking for is like how do clinicians deal with it and then what do you think about the system? Where, where are we going? Because right now it's, people are starting to raise their hands and say like, what's up? We need to figure this out. But what? Is it time to just go to the drawing board or what do you this think? Is the huge, this is the huge, huge issue of medicine now. Mm. I talked to some BU students a couple of years ago. These are second year students or something like that. Uh, actually third maybe. Um, and they were just, they said exactly what you just said. We didn't go into medicine to be data entry clerks. And it had, I won't even go into it. It's all in the book. It's, you know, it's the same narrator, Roy Bash. It's humorous. The fat man's there. It's the whole thing. Yeah, I miss the fat man. Yeah. Can't wait. Um, and uh, they, were, they were saying, we, we hate this. We hate Epic. Everything's Epic. You know, it's a mm -hmm. monopoly, basically. We hate Epic. And they gave the ways that they hated it. And then I said, is there another computer system that you come into, a medical computer system, that is better? And they thought, yeah. They said, what's that? The Veterans Administration system. Interesting. They said it's, it's cl kind of clunky, but you can write note, you can type notes in there for patients like you do on, pa you know, blah, blah, blah. I gave some examples. And I said, well, why do you think it's better? Oh, and they also said, and it's interoperable. You know, it, it, it can communicate with every other VA hospital uh, all over the world. So everybody knows where everybody is. Yeah, and none of the epics don't, are interoperable, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why do you think it's so good? And then a girl said, uh, because there's no money involved. It's the government. It's not right. for billing. Right. Uh, so as the fat, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a clue. As the fat man at the end of this novel says to his team at man's fourth best hospital, he says, blah, blah, blah. So we have to squeeze the money out of the machine. Simple as that. Yeah. That, and it works. That'll work. Yeah. I... That's so interesting. I guess I gotta I gotta ponder on that for a second. So squeezing the money out of the machine means to make the machine not about getting money out of the patient experience. About about the doctor trying to con the insurance company and the insurance company, you know, um, uh, conning back. The the big thing. What is the characteristic of any successful national health care system that we don't have? in a for-profit system. Every diagnosis throughout the system, the country, is the same cost. Interesting. It has the same, that's, that's a primary thing. You have the same, if you go in for an appendicitis and you go have surgery, it's you know $1,260 whether it's in Boston or whether it's in Old Miss. Right, no, which is where I went to school, of course. I know. Yes. Um, I, I don't mean to be so, you know, I'm just, look, I write from emotion as well mm -hmm. as intellect, as you can sure. tell. Yeah. They're always one thing. And spiritual practice, actually, always looking for the larger dimension of this than personal. And this is it. I, I'm very upset about this. Doctors are retiring. I, I had a friend, you know, maybe last year, whenever it was, guy in practice. He was driven psychotic by Epic. 
<laughs> he spent he spent two weeks in a hospital. Yeah, it's um it, it that that's a big issue. We 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 highlighted a couple. I want to say it was about six weeks ago. A um and this is positive on on a small a small note is sure. that there was a uh, a trauma surgeon at Jefferson who self admitted be- before actually um, doing something terrible, which I think is positive. That's what you want to do if you need to have a problem. You acknowledge the problem, but it, the the amount of burnout that a trauma surgeon is going through and and work-life balance on top of work being not what you thought it was going to be. And I think that's something that the house of God did, in my opinion. I'm not in medicine. I call myself a muggle, thanks to J.K. Rowling. Not uh, a what? A muggle. I'm a muggle. What, what's a muggle? So in Harry Potter, oh, sorry. the wizards are wizards, and the people who can't do magic are muggles. That okay. means we're equal. I just didn't. I'm not in medicine. So as a muggle, what I've noticed from the house of God, it was sort of like um, a beacon to say, this is what it's actually like. It's not what you're going to be told it is in medical school but it's going to be completely different it's going to be different within the first 72 hours and there's no going back and now with the size of student loans you can't go back because your marketable skill is to do the thing that you are now trapped to do but although those problems still exist it seems like the sequel is going to say it never gets better because you're not going to be seeing patients like you wanted to see in medical school but it's 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 the same in that it's calling attention to a problem but the sequel seems different in that the problem is not just for residents. It's not just the wake-up call in your 20s. It's this is what your career is shaping up to be. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and choice of career often now is based on not having to do that stuff. Right. You know, and, and realizing, you know, I think in a lot of places, the number one choice for residency of graduating medical students, ready? Emergency room. Interesting. Doc. Oh, insurance. Well, we're gonna gotta it, deal with it. It's right? all. It's almost all pretty much taken care of by the administrators of the emergency room. But it's a shift work job. They they work like what maybe four, ten hour, twelve hour shifts a week. They have the rest of the time off. So people are looking to medicine and places in medicine where they have a life. Yeah. And they make a good enough uh, pay was uh, attending a meeting right here in Boston, in Cambridge, and um, as we sit here in Newton, are we in Newtown? Yeah, yeah New- Newtown. Newton. Yeah, I get confused with all the New England names. Mm-hmm. I'm not from this area. So uh, in can Cambridge, you expect from a Wyoming yeah, guy who that's right. went to Old Miss? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the, if you look at the map of the United States, I'm from the northernmost square state. That's how you can tell Wyoming. Uh, yeah, I, I love it, from, I love it. That's right, we, we fly right over us. Um, but w- w- I heard a talk from, the keynote of the meeting was about the projection of professionals in rheumatology. It was the American College of Rheumatology and it was for spondyloarthritis. And the keynote speaker was discussing, there's a shortage of residencies, but there's not a shortage of interest. So we have to find a way to make this happen. And he, he brought up some interesting points, including uh, he suggested finding a way to make um, either like part-time maternity leave possible or a way that you can invite people into certain specialties or into general care, family medicine, where they weren't constrained by the system because there are people that want to practice but they don't want to give up everything in order to do that that's right yeah people are now taking uh jobs that give them a life that's that's uh um and i but i don't want to um i don't want to be uh terribly pessimistic Mm -hmm. i mean the one thing i say i talk a lot a lot i've talked at every medical school and 50 commencement speeches you know I talk about staying human in medicine and how to do it. And, you know, there, I, I, I think we can get to, if not now, later, you know, what, what, what do you need to do to stay, what does the doctor need to do to stay human in medicine? I will say one more thing in this book. Sure. Which the fat man's the hero in Roy's the he same. He's my hero, for sure. He's my hero, too. <laughs> it's wonderful. You'll love this. Near the end of the book. Sure. He decides, because he's in this book, he's running a clinic that's associated with Man's Fourth Best Hospital, yeah. mm-hmm. okay, because they need, they need his help. <laughs> the last scene, he was uh, going to Hollywood for the bowel, r- bowel right. run of the stars. I remember that. But in fact, he drifted into Silicon Valley and is now rich and famous. Okay? And that sounds about right. Um, but at, toward the end of the book, because this is a clinic and they have to take care of all, you know, it's a public, for a public clinic for people, everybody to come in, it's not private. And uh, so he gets up there, he, he still gives lectures, little lectures 
And this one, you know, it's always with blackboard and chalk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, he's a, a whiz at tech, you know, but so he writes and he writes down uh, the six rackets of American health care, mm -hmm. colon, follow the money. Follow the money. And for me to write that, like what's going on? Mm -hmm. There are six huge interlocking for-profit forces that it's it's impossible to understand to get a yeah. finger on. The fat yeah. man did it, but yeah, well, that yeah, he can do whatever he wants. Essentially, I, it's it's weird because as a journalist, I have the propensity to be hyperbolous when no hyperbole is called for. That is a curse, I suppose. But I've I've been telling people because these are conversations that I have with with friends in in medicine and outside of medicine, and, and it's it's sort of as a journalist and as a storyteller here with you, I, I feel the need to sort of like outside of the realm of medicine so you should, people should start paying attention because this is a real problem and it's not just a problem for doctors and nurses and patients it's going to be a big thing in the next 20 30 five even five years oh, yeah it's yeah. going to be a big deal and it's going to affect all of us because it's not there you doesn't know, seem there's no solution we just can't ignore this well we we i would say two things there's no solution but we can live better mm. in this system than we are living i'll get to that remind me yeah but um the real problem, um, and it's based on you know making profit. Really, that's that's why I said that. But the the real problem, and I don't know that people put it this way. But I've talked to some computer computer people who say maybe this is the right way. Is that the electronic medical record is iterative. You put push a button, opens a box that lets you click from that to that to that to that, to that. So it's an iteration on a protocol. And you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's all, of course, about billing. Right. Di bigger diagnosis, bigger billing. Um, and uh, what we doctors do is not iterative. Here's what a doctor visit used to be like. Patient comes in, uh, you listen to the history, you say, okay, go get you know, I'm going to examine you while they go behind the curtain. You make some notes. What is it? it used to be on a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. But you make some notes. And you, uh, then you go in to do the physical. And you come back out and you say, yes, you can get dressed. And in that moment, when the patient is not there, when you've got the information, what happens to, in good doctors? They pause. They, I would say they muse like the muse, they muse and they let things settle and literally in any good doctor within, unless it, very rarely you get something you don't do this, sometimes it's very complex, but within three minutes, there's an integrative process and you know, this is what I think it is, this is what I'm gonna do about it with tests and treatment. Right. You know, so it's it's really a battle between an iterative 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 process and an integrative process, mm -hmm. which is the only thing humans really do much better. Right, and it, they don't have a time no. to do that. So, my job before a little bit about me, I did um, yeah. communication and, and technical writing on a training team at Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, I worked for and the greatest boss I've ever had. Uh, her name is Kristen Davis, and she was brought on board to bring Epic on online at Jefferson because they had had their own in-house system for right. a long time. But their problem was because Philadelphia is so big, it's a major American city, if they were getting patients transferring, the records were a disaster. Right. So they wanted to go online, and uh, I, I was hired because of my history as a medical writer to represent clinicians. And I, oh, really? yes, to say like, what, how is this going to go over? What are they going to think about it? And I, I sat in quite a few meetings with her in, in the meeting with a lot of people, I was politically correct. And with her, I was going to say, they're, they're going to hate this. <laughs> 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 they're going to hate it a lot. You're right. Yeah. And so I, but I, I know, and I can tell you, this is a, a, meant to be a positive tale that there are people like her and her team, and she's a brilliant hirer and a manager of people. And they are actively and aggressively trying to figure out on one side how to improve the EHR so it's not such a disaster and like they're not in Congress they can't fix billing problems but they're gonna try to figure out how to fix epic and make it easy as possible as well as try to 
make it so that you learn it without having to care that much about it, which is, I think, really key. It's like, we want to take this huge thing off your plate because there are people. I worked with people. I, I worked with this man named Doug. He lived for technical writing and documenting processes the way that you, live, you would work for or you would live for patient care or writing or whatever you want to do. That's what he wanted to do. So we got to find people like Doug to make it easier for you not to have to care about that. But I, I, I just remember shaking my head thinking we are, we are spitting on a fire. This is not, this is not the appropriate way to think about this. We have to find a way to get them out of the training room, get them back in the clinic where they belong. Yeah. Every second they're there, they're not interested in like your technique at the, at the top of the room. They're interested in leaving, right? They don't want to be here. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. We doctors at the FMC, which is the Fat Man Clinic, had to attend a, a day-long orientation to HEAL, H-E-A-L. That's man's fourth best electronic medical record. An hour-long video and workshop with a guy named Bob. The goal was by gaming the HEAL code for any particular diagnosis and treatment to max out money. And in principle, we could max out with clicks in two ways. First was qualitative, choosing the worst diagnosis and the most treatment. Second was quantitative, clicking on as many different severe diagnoses, requiring the most elaborate treatment for as long as possible. The terms he used to hide this gaming of the system were exacting and unintelligible. And then there's a whole bunch of, you know, how algorithmic, meaningful use, monetization, et cetera. Bob made clear that the more expensive the diagnosis and code, the treatment code clicked, the more money the fourth best made. And he warned us that the insurance industry is 24-7 trying just as hard to game us out of our gaming them for cash. That's why, Bob said, we nicknamed our team Coders for Cash. Coders for Cash. We work out of a war room in an undisclosed location. We watch each of you for your choice of click codes from admission to discharge. Finally, doing procedures on patients makes the most money. Fiscally, doing procedures on patients makes the most money. Surgical procedures make the most, most money. Medical care makes the least, except for the diagnosis of sepsis severe. After you click sepsis, the pop-ups ask mild, medium, or hot, severe, like at a Thai restaurant. Yes. I was but, say, buffalo wings. but sepsis is by definition a life-threatening blood infection, always severe. Monetized compared to mild or medium, severe is a cash cow that wins hands down. Mm. We will dog you till the sun goes down. If you click sepsis, you always click severe, the, the code for cash. But then why, I ask, do you have boxes for mild and medium at all? Camouflage, he says, and then he goes on. He spoke passionately about how to squeeze the most money out of earwax. This is true. First, in a moving historical tour, he said earwax is an untapped pool. <laughs> Rampant in our senior citizens, a cause of deafness. How many of you rut routinely earwax your patients? We took this as rhetorical and did not reply. The money in earwax flows by clicking the diagnosis in almost all patients and removing as much volume as you can. Bob then showed on the big screen the stick figure of a doctor sitting at healing. You have to choose between two codes for earwax removal. 40773 is for just taking a syringe and washing it out, reimbursed at $77.33. But 40774, using the metal scooper thingy to remove it, $182.57. The difference, $105.24. And doing both, $359.90. More than the sum of the parts. Multiply per person per year, millions. Guess which procedure for extraction and payment is max, maximum liquidity? Both. Do the right thing. The, the right thing for us at the FMC, Roy and Chuck, was to walk out. So, Chuck, I said, what'd you think of that? Man, it all met, went in one ear and out the other. That, that's such a great point. Like, why... Why would it work out that way? And it opens the door for a lot of fraud and weirdness, too, because what we could oh, yeah. bill for doing both and only do one if the patient didn't really need it. Because I learned from the, some of the fat man's rules that less is more has been published as of 2018. Yeah. Uh, 1,300 or so articles in JAMA where the title is less is more, which is the fat man's, I think, 10th rule. Really? Do yeah. as much nothing as 13th, possible. 13th. 13th rule. Oh, lucky 13th. Do as much nothing as possible. That's right. right. And you know, but that's not nothing. That's, that was the one, I really had a flash of insight with that because I was, the editor said, why don't you collect these laws, you know? 
laws of the house of God. So I came to those, and the last one I wrote down, I'm top, typing, not this place, I was there typing, the delivery of, of, of medical care is to do nothing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, that's not true. And so I said, the delivery of medical care is to do as much nothing as possible. And that is a very, the one rule I would say, think about this. It's genius because it's, it's like an algorithm almost. How do you do mean? as much nothing as possible. It's like, it's like as X approaches zero. Like yeah. You get as close to zero as you can. Right, yeah. because you can hurt people. Right. <laughs> and of course, the system now is to do as much nothing as you, as do as much as you can. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I started out looking into cancer, and I think starting my career in cancer writing probably ignited passion in me. Just cause it was great to go to the meetings and to see all the stuff. It felt like, you know, I assume the space race felt, and people were excited, and I liked talking to the researchers, and they're saying, oh, I can tell my patients it's not as bad as it was, and like that yeah, excitement yeah, was yeah. great for me. But I also found that there were some really intense conversations that families were going to have to have that were not being really talked about. Like, do you want to have this possibility of grade four side effects for 24 months of life and it could cost you a million dollars a year or do you want to like kind of check out and just smoke uh, weed and right a dignified right and journey and and the 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 interesting thing for me is that i don't really think it's up to anybody to make that choice right it's the patient's choice right right? and and, but that's not something that's really being discussed And, and along those lines you find if we run this diagnostic test and you get a false positive that's a disaster that's a disaster for a patient, so it, you, so the the standard of care as we were writing and we were writing more and more page, papers about this, especially for for things that had a positive prognosis if if caught early, was we don't screen at this age anymore. We screen five years later. We screen five years later. We screen five years later. You and know, I thought that's doing as much nothing as possible. That's right. right. You know, and there are some. I want to talk about the good news, mm-hmm. which is a change from the house of God. Yeah. The good news and and what to do. You know. Um. But I remember one of the NYU cancer docs um, talking about a famous patient of his who had uh, colon cancer, and it was, you know, downhill. Uh, but he would go, and the way he would present it was, look, you know, a guy's talking about dying, and about what do I want to do? He said, look, this is, I'm going to talk to you about hurdles, like a race in hurdles. This is the next hurdle. So, you know, if we agree... You want, let's take this next hurdle. And you know, it's a wonderful metaphor. Yeah. Wonderful metaphor. Yeah, I like that. That way you can, you can kind of call it off at any point. Yeah. I always exactly. tell people, because um, I like to, I, as I consider myself a writer, fancy myself a writer, um, mm-hmm. I like to use metaphor, sports metaphor, and I find traveling metaphors are often accurate with medicine as well. Mm-hmm. And I say, being diagnosed with cancer is like getting on a train that's going off a cliff at the end. And you can choose to exit any stop, That's good. or you can choose to stay on. And then nothing is wrong. If you like the view at the very end, you stay on. If you want to get great. off, you get off. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Good for you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, good for you. And um, there are a lot of forces uh, that are, you know, arraigned against that. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's shall we talk a little about the, uh, the movement, the the positivity, the light. Well, uh, the, yeah, but it's it's not it's not. Oh, this is what you do about that. This sure. is what I've come to in my. I'm going to be 74. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> but I've I've had a very, very, very fortunate life in a lot of ways. You know, our lives, but for the flicker of a butterfly's wing, right. neither of us are sitting here. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, I know, right. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. But looking back, it's a hundred percent odds that we're going to be here. Right. You know, it's really interesting. And that concludes this edition of the MD Edge Post Call Podcast. You can listen to previous episodes of the podcast by subscribing wherever podcasts are found. I'd like to thank Mr. Shem for inviting me into his home and taking the time to sit down with me. For everyone at MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews, and this is the Post Call Podcast.